So first, I want to introduce uh, everyone to uh, Susie White, um, who I've known Susie since she was a student at uh, Michigan State University um, and was uh, uh, taking courses in our animal science department. Um, Susie has been a lifelong horse person uh, and she's written and coached in many different disciplines throughout her life. Uh, Susie earned her bachelor's and master's of science degrees uh, at Michigan State University and has published research in equine behavior and nutrition. As a graduate student, Susie coached the MSU Dressage, Western, and Hunt Seat equestrian teams, and they actually did very well uh, while she was coaching. As a graduate, uh, after graduating from MSU, Susie was a professor at Delaware Valley University for 10 years and since has moved back to her hometown in Traverse City, Mich Michigan. Uh, Susie's been involved in many equestrian organizations, including uh, United States Pony Club, uh, 4-H, the Eventing Association, uh, United States Dressage Federation, Federation as a bronze level writer, USDF uh, L program auditor, uh, the British Horse Society as an instructor, and she's also judged at local uh, horse shows. Uh, Susie is currently uh, the MSU Extension 4-H program coordinator for Grand Traverse County. And in addition to uh, her work with uh, MSU Extension, uh, she also runs her own small farm, White Winter Farm, where she resides with her husband, three kids, horses, dogs, cats, and chickens. Uh, so with that, Susie, we'll let you get started. Okay, thank you, Dr. Skelly. So your first horse, it's living the dream for many people. And when we think about your first horse for youth in particular, we think about responsibility, teamwork, teaching patience, conflict resolution, natural consequences. We see kids building confidence, making friends, and then having the ability to compete or do things with their horse. When you're thinking about entering the horse industry, it's important to think about what you wanna do with your horse. Do you want to keep it at your house? Do you want to board it? Do you want to go to competitions? Do you want to ride with friends? And all of those dreams come together when we begin to think about purchasing our first horse. It's very important to consider, are you ready? Even the best dreams can turn terribly badly without preparation. So try out horses first, try out the horse industry. Do you need to buy a horse or are there other opportunities to get started in the horse industry? Some alternatives might include some work to ride programs or volunteering at a local barn to try out helping with horse chores or assisting before and after lessons. Uh, perhaps you could do what's called a care lease. A care lease is when you take over the responsibility of a horse and you pay for all of its expenses, be that it's feed, vet bills, farrier bills, board, etc. Whereas horses can also be leased, a lease is, is a combination of the care lease where you pay for all the horse's expenses, but you also pay a price each month to the horse owner. These traditional leases might be for a high performance horse or a horse with performance experience, a lot more training. And typically you can expect to pay about a third of the purchase price for a traditional lease. There's also half or part-time leases. So maybe you lease a horse, but you also share it with somebody else. So you have uh, the opportunity to ride it, say on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or you can use it in the mornings or at certain events, but not other events. So you share with another program or other students. And then many people get started just by sharing or borrowing. Their friend has a horse or they go riding and ride their friend's second horse so they can safely go out trail riding or schooling together. 
And then of course, camps and lessons. Camps in particular are a great place to try out horses with kids, um, whether it be an overnight summer camp or a day program or a short course, but, but especially with kids, that's a really great place to just try it out and see if it's something that the youth is really interested in. Dr. Skelly already alluded to the commitment that a horse is. So when you purchase the horse, that's just the beginning. Think about the commitment in terms of time. It's a year round commitment. Unlike a boat that you can put in storage for the winter, horses are still eating, still need vet care, still need hoof care, and many of them still need exercise. There are some horses that people put away for a few months in the winter and then recondition back up in the spring but not all horses do actually handle that situation well. So think about the year round care and how you'll be able to accommodate that and purchasing a horse that will fit into what works for you. And then of course the purchase price. So again, the, the, the costs include purchase price, yearly veterinary costs, which may be an annual visit or fall and spring usually. Farrier costs, this is trimming the horse's hooves that needs to be done every six to eight weeks. Feed costs and board, this could be a whole other webinar just discussing the costs involved in a horse throughout different areas of the country. But certainly you should have a rough budget and ask experts in your area so that you're aware of those costs. So you're ready to purchase a horse. The first thought is the rider. Who is the horse for? Is this going to be a shared horse? Are you going to share it amongst family members or friends? Uh, is this for one particular person in your family? What age is the person? Are they particularly young or older? This picture is actually a picture of my family. I'm standing in the back and my daughter Marion is in front and she is turning 11 this month. My son, Henry, is riding this horse, and my oldest son, Riley, similar to Dr. Skelly's son, grew up early in a barn, and I thought for sure he'd be my rider, but he enjoys other activities um, and rides occasionally. Think about the size, uh, experience level of the rider, your goals and expectations, as well as resources. Are you going to have a support system around once you purchase this horse? What facilities do you have as well as finances for extra costs should you need them once the horse is purchased? So let's talk a little bit about facilities and extra condition, extra considerations. The first thought is where are you going to keep your horse? Are you going to board it at a commercial or small facility? Are you going to do self-care, which means somebody else has facilities, but they will let you keep the horse there if you do all the work, or do you have a setup that you either already have or can make at your home? Do you have access to arenas, trails, an indoor arena? For instance, this picture is taken at the Devon Horse Show, and, and these are hunter-jumper style horses. And if you're going to buy a hunter jumper style horse and plan to learn how to jump your horse, you would want access to jumps, for instance, and a boarding facility that will allow you to jump your horse. So think about farm limitations. Some boarding farms may say, I only have room for you to bring in a mare or a gelding. Some boarding facilities say there are certain vices or stereotypical behaviors that horses can exhibit that we won't allow. For instance, some horses do something called cribbing, and this is a vice that many people are fine with purchasing a horse that cribs, and it can be managed in different ways, but there are boarding facilities that will say, you may not board a horse that cribs here. So consider that. Um, who is gonna help you with the horse? Should you need help or when you need help? And does the boarding facility allow outside trainers? or do, the trainer that they do have, is, is that a good fit for you? And certainly equipment for the horse. Horses are usually sold without anything, perhaps the halter and lead rope. That's kind of the minimal standard. That being said, always ask, because many people will sell you the equipment that's fitted to the horse. 
um, maybe at an additional price, and some people will include it in the purchase price. So you should certainly ask that, but realize that the standard is you buy the horse and you get the halter and the lead rope. Uh, and then ask about maintenance needs. So we'll talk more at the end of this about these questions to ask, but I'm just throwing it out now as a consideration. So when we think about the horse, we're going to discuss the age, the sex, the size, breed or gates of the horse, the training that has had up until the, the purchase point, competition record. That may or may not be important to you, but if you're planning on traveling with your horse and taking it places, a competition record is evidence that the horse has been accustomed to traveling and going places. And if you're planning on competing the horse, a competition record is evidence that the horse has done that successfully in the past. Ask about management, health history of the horse, color. Don't prioritize color, although it is important to fall in love with the horse you choose. And there's an old saying in the horse industry that a good horse is never a bad color. So try your hardest to let color be lower on the list. So let's go back and talk a little bit more about the age of the horse. In general, a horse for a first time horse buyer should be at least five years of age. And that five years of age is an important age because many associations don't allow horses under five to compete with youth or they have special divisions for those horses under five. So for instance, um, so, so depending on what you're going to do with your horse, keep that as a consideration. In addition, the assumption is that a horse that's at least five has had several years of experience being handled and trained. Old age doesn't necessarily equate good training and disposition. So just because the horse is five or 14 or 24 doesn't mean that it's had the experience that you want, but it's definitely a consideration. Much older horses for young riders and inexperienced riders is a good thing. And the way that we can maintain horses with veterinary care and nutrition and farrier care has found that horses can live much longer and not only live longer, but be very usable. Um, my competition dressage horse is a 17 one hand warm blood who I competed at fourth level dressage at a USDF show at the age of 22. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty cool to me. Um, don't expect a child and horse to learn together. That can be very, very um, uh, dangerous <laughs> and, um, and is in general is, is not a good situation without a lot of support. And for a first horse, that's just not a safe way to go. One of the and things I- Susie, I, yeah. I, would, I would also say, uh, if you're an adult and uh, you have very little horse experience, the same saying goes <laughs> along with you. Don't expect that you and this young horse will learn together because it usually does not work out well. Thank you, Dr. Skelly. Another thing I often see advertised is low miles because we think about cars, but that's not generally a good thing. Um, I like horses that have been used a lot, but used well, not used so that they're sour and have developed bad behaviors or they have physical limitations because of the way they were used. But if horses are used well, conditioned properly, trained properly, they can be used a lot for a long time. Anything else, Dr. Skelly there? All good. Good. So when you're thinking about the sex or gender of the horse, stallions do not make good first horses. They cannot be ridden by youth in most associations. They display stallion-like behavior and horses should only be kept a stallion if, they're, if you're planning on 
breeding them and only the best should be kept for breeding. So a stallion is a suitable purchase for somebody who's uh, developing a breeding program and has breeding goals to work with and, and, and plan around. Uh, stallions are thus gelded and they're called geldings and geldings we often see in competition horses and riding school programs and for sale and these tend to have more stable temperaments as opposed to your stallions and mares. Mares can have behavioral changes during their heat cycles. So there is medication that you can put the mare on. It's another added monthly cost and potential um, risk associated with putting them on the medication or, or doing what you need to do working with your veterinarian to manage those cycles. Um, but, but keep in mind, different mares uh, react differently. So it's really important if you're looking at a mare to ask about that. Uh, how they might change. I've seen mares that are completely fine and don't have any noticeable changes once they're working with a person. Um, and then I've certainly seen mares that become very difficult or even unrideable during certain periods of time. And that might be okay, but you have to take that into consideration. There's a funny saying that people repeat, you tell a gelding what to do, you ask a stallion and you discuss it with a mare. And um, that's just a funny, fun saying, and there are exceptions to all of these rules, but this is just an overview and something to consider. Uh, Susie, uh, we do have a question relating yeah. to this slide. Um, so someone is asking, would it be advisable to buy, let's say an eight to nine year old stallion and geld it? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the concern there is the stallion-like behavior has already been uh, ingrained, replicated over time. And often, even once you geld that horse, uh, you will see stallion-like behavior, sometimes for years, sometimes for the lifetime of the horse. Um, so it is possible, but uh, generally not advisable if you can find a horse that's been gelded early enough that it never exhibited the stallion-like behavior to begin with. Next, size. Size of the horse may matter. Um, I, the, small riders uh, looking at ponies or small horses, youth being more engaged when they can do their own grooming and tacking up. And I actually have a great story about this. Again, I have three children and I was working as a professional horse trainer and they were in the barn and around horses and I always had lots of horses to ride for my kids to ride. But every horse they were around, I said, oh, don't walk there, oh, stand with me, oh, you have to lead like this. And then a friend of mine said, hey, there's this pony I wanna buy and it's near you and I've got everything all arranged, will you go pick it up for me? And I picked up this little pony and it was for her own kids and I picked up the pony and I couldn't get it to her house for a week, so I had to keep it. And I watched as my kids led the pony around, groomed the pony, tacked up the pony, and I didn't have to do anything or say anything. And the pony was safe, and my kids could do it all themselves. And I ended up asking my friend if I could just keep it for a couple months, and I did. <laughs> and it was the best decision ever, because to see the kids have that independence, they truly, that was the turning point when my kids learn to love horses when they could do it themselves without mom telling them what to do or working really hard to keep them safe around horses. And there's a huge sense of independence when the kids can do it themselves. In the lower picture, this is a um, little horse that I boarded at my house for a while. It was a Christmas present for another youth. And when it came to my house, the people that bought it said, hey, use it, do whatever you want. And he rode and he drove. And at the time, my son in this picture was six riding him. Um, so also consider safety on the ground, mounting and dismounting, particularly for older horses, or I mean for older people, dismounting. I've trained horses to go to a mounting block to dismount, but sometimes getting off a really tall horse can be a little painful to jump down or step down on people's knees. So for older riders, this is also a consideration. Um, we, we talk a lot about carrying capacity of horses and, and the general rule is about 20% of the horse's body weight. This can change depending on the horse's top line strength, their cannon bone circumference, their body balance, their soundness, their saddle and equipment fit. 
So again, work with a professional to find a suitable size that fits you well and will be comfortable for you both handling and riding. Susie, we do have a question relating to this sure. slide. Um, so um, whoop, it looks like, hold on, it moved on me. Um, so if you had a youth that was, let's say, four foot ten, and you have an adult that, let's say, is five six, mm -hmm. uh, what would you recommend on size? Sure. So the size may be something to consider in terms of your performance goals. Uh, and the youth is probably going to grow, so that's something else to consider. Um, but I will tell you, and just so everybody's clear, a pony is not a young horse, but it's a horse of shorter stature. So ponies are up to 14.1 hands, or 14.2 hands, whereas horses are taller than that. You'll often find small horses at a, at a lower price point in some of the performance areas. So I would say that smaller horse size, right around 15 hands, 15, two hands, maybe a pony that's 14, one, depending on the size of the adult that's five, six. Um, but but in that range is very suitable. Uh, So let's talk a little bit about breeds and gates of horses. When we talk about gates, that's the sequence of repetitive movement that the horse's legs do in order to produce movement. So get, horses come gated and non-gated, and those terms are used in different ways. But in general, your standard horse, we think about as doing the gates, the walk, the trot, the canter and the gallop. Whereas a horse that's gated does, sometimes does all of those gates and more, or might do different gates. Particularly they might walk and then tolt, or they might walk and then do the running walk. So they have uh, different gates that they do. And this is important because if you're going into a competition or a performance area, you wanna make sure your horse is moving the way that the judges expect you to, the horse to, and it fits with the rules and regulations. So gated horses are things like Tennessee walking horses, Missouri fox trotters. The nice thing about gated horses is they're very smooth for the rider. So especially riders that might have some physical limitations or back problems, gated horses can be a lovely fit to smoothly cover ground and be more comfortable while they're riding the horse. There are also a lot of trail riders that use gated horses and there are competitions um, for gated horses as well. Then when we look at the other non-gated breeds, we can divide them up into different categories. Stock breeds, such as quarter horses and paints, these tend to have mellower dispositions, are trainable and tractable. Your saddle type horses are breeds and horses such as Arabians, saddlebreds. These horses tend to be a bit more spirited, high stepping, maybe more energetic. Pony breeds, are usually what we call easy keepers, meaning you don't have to feed them very much. They're sturdy and uh, very often have few soundness issues. Uh, pony breeds are like the Halflinger, the Shetland, the Welsh Pony, Connemara Pony. Uh, beware if you're, to confirm height size, if you're seeking out a pony in particular. Uh, in Europe, they call ponies at a different height size than in the United States. So just keep that in mind. Uh, draft breeds as well as draft crosses. So maybe a, a Belgian cross with a quarter horse. We see those quite often as riding horses as well. And then warm bloods. And your warm bloods are like your Dutch warm blood, your trepaner. The warm bloods tend to be higher level performance horses. They're typically larger mast, very athletic, maybe bigger movers. We see them in jumping and dressage and various other places. 
And then other horses and equids include donkeys and mules. So as you're considering your first horse, think about the priorities. Temperament, soundness, previous training, performance record, current fitness level, fancy, pretty. I always say pick three, you don't get them all. <laughs> You could get them all often and pay a premium. Um, and of course, we're still considering age, sex, breed, and height. When we talk about soundness, we want a horse that's healthy and serviceably sound is a term you might hear. What that means is it may have some physical limitations, but it can still perform and do its job quite well and adequate. So some arthritis, for instance, may be okay. And you might wanna look at what you can do to manage that, as well as work with a veterinarian before the purchase to determine uh, how to manage or maintain any potential soundness issues. But serviceably sound can definitely be okay in a first horse. Confirmation means the way that the horse is put together and the way that its bones align to create the structure and carrying capacity. You want this to be as good as possible, but it doesn't have to be perfect. And a really important factor that I consider is has the horse held up thus far? So if I'm looking at a horse that's been a pleasure trail horse, and now I want a youth to take it and teach it how to jump three foot courses. I might look pretty closely at its soundness and confirmation because my expectations are changing. But if it's held up very well doing the job it had been doing, and that's what you're looking to do, that's a really good indicator. Temperament, temperament, temperament. Very, very, very important factor. You want a horse that's calm and kind and forgiving. These two horses in the picture, I actually know them both very, very well. And the gray horse is an Arabian who we used to joke that he was only an Arabian by breed. And he was actually very, very, very calm, kind, and forgiving. And this other horse is Chipper, who you saw at the beginning of the presentation. And he was our second pony after the first pony I described that I picked up for a friend. When I returned that first pony to my friend, then I loaded up this chipper pony and have had him with me for almost six years now. My daughter was five in that picture. So where do you look for a horse? Where would you find a horse? Ask around, ask your horse professionals, ask your trainer, ask your riding instructor, ask friends that have horses. Go to horse events, go watch horse shows, go to a horse expo, go to clinics. 4-H, um, if you're in a 4-H club or you know 4-H leaders or pony club leaders or other horse associations. Looking in horse publications, Horse sale websites. I put Dream Horse as a simple example, but there are actually many, many, many out there. So searching the classifieds. But please be warned that there is a lot of fraud out there. And um, when we talk about the inquiry process and looking for a horse, ask your first questions and don't give out your information until you're truly interested in the horse. Um, so yes, there are a lot of websites out there. Social media, um, Facebook doesn't allow the sale of animals on Facebook, but there are different routes and forums and ways that people do it anyway. And a lot of times people just advertise, hey, I have horses looking for a new home or I have horses for sale, contact me. Um, horse traders and dealers. So often they make their business and hopefully develop a reputation around providing and finding right matches for people. Um, horse rescues and horse sales. So at horse sales are, uh, could be auctions. Um, there's 
situations where they might have a weekly auction, for instance, as well as sales. So it can be a little hard to, to differentiate, but typically a sale is held on a less regular basis than just a weekly auction um, does it, has horses that pass through with all different histories and usually it's uh, higher risk, maybe lower end horses, you're provided a lot less information about the horse. Whereas an annual sale might have horses of all one discipline or type or breed with a full pedigree and uh, notes and description about the horse. So you've found the horse, you have a prospect, you found one you like. The first inquiry is where to start. And this is where you're gonna ask your basic questions, confirm the age, the breed, the size of the horse, the horse's experience, their registration status, and the horse's price. Um, and then you wanna look at pictures and videos. Almost all sellers are ready to go with pictures and videos. And I am typically not picky about what I get in terms of my videos. I just want to see something. I want to see something. And usually the seller will have something ready. And often they'll say, hey, do you want to see more? Do you want to see something specific? So it's so easy to transfer uh, quick videos now that that's a great place to start. Keep notes on the horses you inquire about because as soon as you start looking at two or three horses, it's easy to begin to get a little confused. Uh, make a plan to try the horse and bring an expert if possible. So bringing an expert along, you want to bring somebody in your field of interest. If you're looking at a dressage horse, bring somebody familiar with dressage, for instance. Uh, should have a good understanding of your ability and resources should be unbiased and unemotional, willing to ride the horse prior to purchasing, may require a fee or commission on the sale of the horse. And I always remind people, you must be willing to accept no if you're bringing a professional. And many more times than once, I have hooked up my horse trailer, sure that we were going to purchase a horse for somebody and went to get the horse and had to say, no, we're not coming home with the horse. So realize that that can happen and does happen. And Dr. Skelly, you just let me know when you're gonna jump in. I'm not sure exactly what, which slide you're gonna take over. Oh, keep going, you're doing great. Okay. <laughs> um, don't buy a horse expecting to change him. So I'm a horse tra trainer and I sometimes think this and I always have to watch and catch myself. Assume you are buying that horse as it is and determine what things are gonna work and be okay with you. There is no perfect horse out there, not a one. And the more you learn about horses, the more you learn to find and pick and see these things. Um, but, but, go in saying, I'm looking for the horse that fits and is suitable to me. Plan to keep, lesson, keep taking lessons and keep getting help. Buying the horse isn't the end. And this is a lifelong journey and process. Never jeopardize your safety. It is better to waste, never feel like you're wasting somebody's time when you go to try the horse or inquire about a horse. And many times I've driven three hours only to spend 30 minutes and say, nope, we're out, we're good, never mind, thank you so much for your time. Um, so it's always okay to step back and cut your losses at any time, there's no obligation. Um, even the experts make wrong horse purchases. And I have lots of stories about wrong horse purchases, um, including sometimes what you think might be the best fit uh, doesn't work in a new management situation. So horses, you want to get as much history as you can, but horses changing management situations, owners, facilities, equipment,
can struggle a little bit and uh, they, they don't always become the horse that you bought over time. Susie, I, I always tell people, you know, professionals can afford uh, to make that wrong horse purchase because they're usually a little bit more hardcore in uh, moving that horse along when it doesn't work mm -hmm. out. Uh, the problem is with a lot of uh, first-time horse owners, when they do purchase that horse, if it's not the right fit, they get so emotionally attached to it, uh, they don't have the fortitude to send that horse down the road. So um, it's yeah. really important with the, those fir that first horse or so, you know, know yourself, know, uh, know what you, uh, how you will react emotionally to uh, owning a horse. Yes, and I absolutely love horses. I love my horses, and selling horses is okay. And get help selling a horse. That could be a whole nother webinar. But if you do need to sell a horse, get help selling a horse, just like you got help buying a horse, because there's a process to that. So uh, before you arrange your first visit, uh, some of you at the beginning have also talked about the timeline and horse sales are generally pretty slow in the winter. They pick up in the fall and the fall is a great time when camps are closing and kids are going to school and kids go off to college and you may start looking for a horse and be watching a horse that's a great fit in the summer with intent or plans to purchase that in the fall or realize a lot of horses come up for sale in the fall that people just don't want to winter all winter long. And then spring is another hot time where horses come up for sale. In the current climate, there's a little bit of a hold on horse sales at the, at the moment. It's a good time to start browsing online and getting an idea for advertisements, reaching out to get videos, but there's a hold on going to see and try horses right now. But I predict a lot of horses coming up for sale that are great horses that were supposed to be used in camps and leased out that will become available this summer. So just another something to think about. All right, so you found that prospect. You've called and set up your first visit. So I typically request for my first visit that I wanna take the time and say, listen, if you could just leave the horse in its stall or pasture, wherever it is, I'll get there and I'll watch you do your whole routine with the horse. And that can be really important, especially for your first horse and getting to know this horse at a different level. So watch how the horse is in its stall or in the pasture. Watch how it gets along with the other horses or interacts with them. Watch how the owner handles the horse. How is the horse to catch? How does it lead? How does it react going in and out of the barn and the gate? Then the next step is the owner grooms it. The owner tacks it up. You watch the owner ride the horse. And I'm going to tell you that I always tell people again before I come to visit, I will expect you or somebody you trust to get on and ride this horse and show the horse to us. And I'm gonna tell you that I'm still surprised how many people say, oh really? And I say, yes. And then more than once I've gone to see a horse and they suddenly don't have anybody to get on that horse first. Oh no, I can't today. Or my rider didn't show up. Don't get on that horse, okay? Somebody that owns the horse, if it's a riding horse, they need to arrange to have somebody ride that horse and show it to you before you even consider getting on the horse. So you watch somebody ride the horse, show the horse to you. And then if it's all still going well, then perhaps your professional will get on and ride or you, the person buying the horse, will get on and ride. The goal is not to press all the buttons and see how hard you can work the horse. The, the goal is to say, do I feel safe and comfortable? Am I able to control this horse? Is it going well? ask a lot of questions, um, a lot. So we'll go through some of the questions soon. Warning signs. So one of the things I love about, this is a picture of a rearing horse, and you can see from the context of the picture that this is a really well-trained horse. This is a competitive show jumper, 
in England at a competition and this horse is rearing. So guess what? Horses rear, kick, buck, and bite. If you uh, put them in that situation or if you're willing to tolerate it because they're at a high enough level. Your first horse, you don't want those things. <laughs> so rearing is when they go up. I'm gonna tell you as a horse professional, this is a hard no when I have a horse that rears. Very few horses um, do I work with to, to work through that with a first time rider of any age. Um, Kicking, again, watch the context. When does the horse kick? Does it kick out at other horses? If you walk by somebody's stall, when you're grooming it? Biting, is it biting because it wants to get treats? Has the horse been overfed treats by hand? Is it pinning its ears and could potentially hurt somebody? Bucking is when it uh, picks its butt up or its back up. Again, looking at the context of the bucking. If is it high, strung, overly sensitive? Again, we want something kind and tolerant. Um, shying or spooking, herd bound. Being herd bound means that it's hesitant to leave other horses. This may not be a problem if you say, listen, my husband and I are gonna trail ride and we're gonna buy two horses and we're always gonna trailer them together and then we're always gonna trail ride together. I think a herd bound horse will be great. Great, but if you're looking for say, a competitive show horse that you want to take from the herd and practice in an arena alone, something to consider. Tail ringing. Is the tail swish, swishing at flies and bugs? Or horses also swish their tail when they're irritated or tense. So look at the contents of the tail ringing or swishing. Ear pinning, diving to the center of the ring while you're trying to ride or the owner's trying to ride and control the horse resistant to that rider's aids when they apply their hand or their leg? Is he really back sore? Um, noticeable lameness. If the horse seems like it moves funny, that means it's a little lame somewhere and you want to look more closely at that. I always feel all over the horse's body for heat and swelling. Even if you don't know anything about horses, feel for heat spots to look more closely at as well as areas of swelling or sensitivity. Weight, looking at the body condition score. The body condition score goes from one to nine with five being moderate and ideal, where we don't see the horse's ribs unless the horse is um, trotting, we might see a shadow of the ribs and we look at various other points on the horse, but we're looking, if the horse is not at a body condition score at a five, ask why. Beware of tricks of the trade. And I certainly don't mean this lovely lady doing a very cool trick on her horse. What I mean is tricks that might be trying to deceive a potential buyer. Things such as riding down the horse before showing it for sale. I had a youth that purchased a horse on her own and um, when I, the first day I met the horse, I said, why does this horse have girth galls, which are big girth sores on its side? And she said, oh, the horse hadn't been ridden very much. So she said she took it out for two hours the day before and rode it for an hour before I got there. I said, well, that's riding down the horse before the sale. That means that she tried to ride it till it was exhausted, so it appeared calm and quiet when maybe it wasn't. And lo and behold, we had two years of hard work ahead of us. That horse was very sensitive, had a lot of excess energy, and proved to be too much for the youth that we bought it for. Um, drugs or medications to mask the horse's attitude, behavior, or lameness. Um, I ask people if they have had the horse on any medications in the past or is the horse on any medications now? Again, when you just ask honestly and kindly, I'm a little surprised at how many people just tell me what they've given the horse. <laughs> um, I also, during a pre-purchase exam, if I have any concerns about the horse, have had veterinarians draw a vial of blood to test later if I have any potential concerns for the future. 
filing the teeth down that you can tell an approximate age um, of the horse by looking at the horse's teeth. And um, there are people that will file the teeth in different ways, dyeing the hair, false registration papers, and upselling at sales barns. So we mentioned horse dealers and there are great reputable horse dealers out there, but there are also some that are less reputable and they will sell you a horse with a guarantee and you might pay $1,000 for that horse and they know it's not the right fit, but then you can bring it back. And when you bring it back, they say, oh, well, that's the only one I had at $1,000. So if you, you can pick a new horse and pay me another 2,000 and then I'll give you another guarantee. And it goes on like that. So um, just be careful of that. Safety, wear a riding helmet when trying a new horse, ride in an enclosed area free of obstacles. Again, I have been out moving things and not getting on horses until things are moved and gates are shut, assess the situation and ask if you can change things or set things up a little bit safer if you don't see that things look safe. Bring your own saddle in case the available saddles don't fit you, but be careful and make sure that the horse is willing to accept it and that it does fit the horse as well. And don't ride if there's any speculation that the horse is too much. It is absolutely okay to say no and to not get on that horse or to say no at any point in time and thank them very much for their time and move on. Your safety is much more important. So questions to ask the horse seller. You want to confirm the age, the height, the breed, the training performance, and ownership history. Remember, you've already asked that before you even came to look at the horse. Ask again, because sometimes people get mixed up, and then they forget, and then they remember. Um, health history. Has the horse ever colicked or foundered, had lameness, respiratory issues, surgery, allergies? Again, I have asked these questions over the phone, but when I'm there in person and I say, hey, has he ever been lame before? I noticed this scar here, or I noticed this swelling there. Oh yeah, about a year ago, okay. So it's important to know those things and re-ask them, that's okay. Um, ask about health maintenance. Does the horse, has it had regular injections of its joints? Is it on a medication to keep it sound? Does it need to have the chiropractor adjust it every other week to be able to perform at that level? Know the whole picture. And a, a perfect example of this is I have a young pony club student who's moving up the levels in pony club and she's looking for a more competitive horse, but it costs more and we expect more out of the horse. And a lot of what she's looking at requires a lot of maintenance for the horse to perform at that level, but in Northern Michigan, we don't have as much access to veterinary care um, as you might in a more uh, suburban or urban area. So we're, we're shying away from some of those horses. Ask about horseshoeing, behavior, and other things such as feeding, up, feeding turnout, and other management equipment preferences, etc. After the first visit, consider a second visit. It's okay to be unannounced, ensure that tricks aren't being used to sell the horse, especially if you're going through a sales barn or a horse dealer or a commercial riding stable when that horse might, or the facility might be more open to the public. Set up your pre-purchase examination or your vet check, arrange transportation for the horse, and discuss price. So you ask about the price initially, and then this is another good time to discuss the price. Additionally, the pre-purchase exam can also be used to negotiate the price. The pre-purchase exam is done by a veterinarian and this veterinarian is the buyer's choice. It would be your choice. I highly, 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 highly recommend a pre-purchase exam. This can save a lot of heartache. They can't guarantee that the horse will be sound for its whole life and that no problems will occur in the future, but they can often find little things that you want to know about. No horse is perfect, perfect, and it's not a pass fail. It's a let's find out everything we can about this horse so we know how to properly care for and manage this horse. 
They may discuss with you the management of special problems like arthritis, what are your options? You should have a full health record history of the horse that you can then discuss with the veterinarian during the pre-purchase exam. You pay for the pre-purchase exam and the veterinarian is working for you. A lot of sellers will ask if they can see or have the pre-purchase exam and that is up to you completely. There's no obligation, especially if you decide not to purchase that horse, that pre-purchase exam is yours. You don't have to give it to the seller. A Coggins test is a blood test that's required for all horses in Michigan to have done once every 12 months, and it's required to transport or move the horse. So make sure the horse either has a Coggins test or that test gets pulled when the veterinarian is there for the pre-purchase exam. This is just a really rough cost estimation. Your grade horse just for trail or pleasure riding you want to, is usually about $1,500 and up. An entry level show horse, $2,500 and up. Intermediate show horse, $3,500 and up. And your advanced show horse is $5,000 and up. Price may not determine suitability. So even if you find a $30,000 horse and decide to pay that price, that doesn't mean it's the right horse for you, definitely. Susie, um, there's one question that came in, and I think this individual has to sign off here soon. Um, okay. But they, they were wondering, um, what is the best breed for um, a hunter jumper? Sure. Um, in the, it depends on at what level you plan to compete. Um, when you're looking at a, purchasing a hunter jumper horse, you want to definitely have that pre-purchase exam and look closely at soundness because of the extra stress and strain on the horse. In the hunter-jumper world, we see warm bloods, thoroughbreds, quarter horses, or stock-type horses can make really nice low-level hunter-jumper horses. We also see a lot of ponies and pony crosses, Connemaras and Welsh ponies. Um, so those would be some of the first breeds that come to mind, given all of these other suitability concerns. So you're getting closer to buying that first horse. If you start to feel pressured, leave. The horse should be the right fit for you and you should be willing to wait. Don't fall by the first horse you fall in love with. Although you may end up going back to the first horse after you've seen a few more. Um, and there's a difference between, well, I've got other buyers, I really need you to figure this out this week or in the next 24 hours, if you could let me know this information. That happens all the time. But if you feel like somebody's doing a hard sell, oh, he'll be better at your house. Oh, he'll work out of it. You know, he's always a little bit like this in the spring. No, be careful. If you trust your intuition and don't feel pressured. Um, but realize that there are very few standard sale practices in the horse industry. So communicate, communicate, communicate frequently. I cannot tell you how many horses I've had, what feels like sold out from underneath me, happens all the time. Um, but the best thing you can do is ask. So when I make that first phone call, say, listen, I can't come down until Friday. Will you um, not have anybody look at the horse till Friday? Or I can't come till next week. Can you let people look at the horse, but agree to let me be first buyer? So it's negotiable. You have to communicate, you have to ask. This is when working with a professional can be really helpful. Um, but realize sometimes people will ask for a deposit, um, usually a refundable deposit. Uh, holds, again, ask about holds, ask. Usually if you communicate it, you would hope that people would then about, you know, agree to what you communicated, but there are very, very few standard sale practices and rules here. And now you've decided you wanna purchase the horse. You've had the pre-purchase exam, you're happy with it, you've negotiated a price, sign a purchase agreement. My advice is to keep it really, really simple. 
be very, very careful with buyback contracts, co-ownership, split care. There are a lot of these funny little sale agreements out there, but I would highly suggest a clean purchase agreement and then keep in contact with the person. I sold four horses last spring and they send me updates and we communicate and I give them advice and I love the pictures and it's fun and exciting. Um, if the horse is registered, get the signed transfer papers. I didn't mention this, but you should ask to see the registration papers. The last four horses I bought that were registered, um, three of them did not have clean registration papers in hand. And I had to pay a lot of association fees to get it all figured out and get that transferred and get that registration papers in my name. Um, the last horse that I purchased, uh, I, re I realized this right away and they ended up paying all those fees. So I ended up getting the horse for a very great deal. But um, see the papers and get them signed when you pick up that horse. Um, set up arrangements with your boarding barn or your farm so you're all set to bring the horse home. Hey Susie, I wanted to just add a experience with the uh, buyback contracts too. I, my uh, niece uh, several years ago purchased her first horse and it was a cute little pony uh, but hadn't really done a lot and uh, the uh, previous owner wanted to put a uh, buy, she had first dibs to buy back uh, that pony at the price that uh, my niece had paid for it and I talked to my uh, brother-in-law out of that I said mm -hmm. like you said keep it clean and sure enough uh, once uh, they put all of the uh, you know writing lessons and training fees into this pony she really turned out to be the whip and uh, they ended up selling her for you know about three to four times the price uh, the purchase price and she was well worth it by then because they had put that amount of time into her uh, so I, I'm in total agreement. Uh, uh, don't uh, get, that's where emotion comes into play uh, mm -hmm. in that buying and selling issue, but make it a clean, uh, clean break. And uh, I think everybody's better off. Excellent. And we said throughout this presentation that buying the horse is not the end. It's a step in the middle somewhere. So one of the best things you can do after purchasing your first horse is continuing your education. And here are some great horses through, of course, My Horse University, as well as Extension Horses. They offer free articles, learning lessons, videos, and more. Look for local resources in your club uh, or in your area as well for associations and learning opportunities. So other questions? Susie, we've had quite a few questions uh, in the queue and I've answered a few, but I'm gonna let you also uh, take a stab at them. Okay. Um, uh, Lindsay's asking, how many horses should I look at before choosing the right horse? That's a great question. <laughs> and there's no magic number. Um, what I would suggest is before you begin your horse search, is to make a description of your ideal horse. And then when you begin the process, you'll decide what is okay and what you'll tolerate. Often what I find is once people begin the horse searching process, they decide that their budget isn't suitable to what they actually want. They decide that they actually want a horse much older than they originally thought. They also decide that they might be willing to accept a few other things that aren't as perfect as their original description. So I would say that if you do a good job searching through descriptions and then making that first phone call where you see um, videos and then you go try the horse, um, I would say most of my clients, and I've helped a lot of clients buy horses over time, don't actually sit on and look at 
more than five or six horses before they find the horse that the, is the right fit for them. Um, but that can vary tremendously. And I certainly know people who have been looking for two years and tried 20 horses. Um, but usually it's in that first group of three that you actually sit on that you find the horse if you do a good job in your original, in your initial search. And uh, Susie Nadine is asking, um, would you recommend an Arabian or a thoroughbred for a novice intermediate rider looking to jump in the future? That's a great question. Um, Arabians are lovely horses and I actually just bought one in December. I have a two-year-old in my backyard. Um, but they're not necessarily known for their uh, jumping uh, experience, but they're really known for their kind disposition. Thoroughbreds are known for their athletic ability and great jumping ability, but can also be too athletic. So again, mentioning that you're a novice rider, I'm going to assume that if you are looking at an Arabian and a thoroughbred and deciding between the two, both of them would be highly schooled and trained with jumping experience. And I would choose the one that is the best fit based on other factors than breed. And I'd add in there too, don't be scared of uh, crossbred horses. So you ah. may find a half Arab, half thoroughbred that really fits your bill, or you may find an appendix uh, quarter horse that would be half thoroughbred uh, that maybe has the temperament and disposition you're looking for along with some of the athletic ability for the jump course. Excellent point. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, let's see here. Uh, we have a question. Um, if you're not enrolled in lessons or aren't around a lot of horse people, how would you choose a veterinarian for your pre-purchase exam? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I've purchased a number of horses from out of my geographical area. So um, I might not know all the veterinarians that are available in that area. So one of the things that I've done to help find a veterinarian is I ask the barn that's selling the horse who their veterinarian is and what veterinarian they use. And then um, I am willing to call that veterinarian and find out if they have other vets at their practice because I know that that practice goes to that barn and I see if there's other veterinarians at that practice that haven't seen or looked at the horse that could do the pre-purchase exam. Another way to do it is to um, uh, contact a state veterinary association to get a list of veterinarians in that county or city or area to call, and certainly just a general web search as well. Yeah, and the um, <clears throat> AAEP, the American Association of Equine Practitioners, uh, will have uh, equine veterinarians listed in their locations and contact information, so they may be a good resource as well. And do ask the price, because the pre-purchase exam will vary at minimum $150, but many start at $500. And that may be a determining factor as well in who you choose. Also, you don't necessarily need to be present when the pre-purchase exam is done. However, it's beneficial if you can be present. And I've also done it where somebody's done FaceTime with me or some other virtual engagement so that you can observe and watch and be present to immediately ask questions. Um, Elizabeth wants to know what would be some of the best breeds for trail riding? Temperament, temperament, temperament. <laughs> <laughs> so a horse that I, you know, my first thought, and Dr. Skelly, you know, might agree with me. My first thought was, um, if you're just going to do pleasure riding, is one of the stock bred horses. A nice quarter horse or paint that's been bred to be trainable. They tend to be less spooky and reactive um, with good temperaments. And if you find that you really love trail riding and want to become a competitive trail rider riding endurance or competitive trail over 25 miles at a competition, 
then we see a lot of Arabians. Yeah, and I would add in there too, don't forget some of your gated breeds like yeah. your Missouri Fox Trotters and your Tennessee Walkers. Uh, they both have, are known for really great dispositions mm -hmm. and uh, a really smooth ride. So especially a lot of our, our older riders are um, getting into uh, those gated breeds for trails. Absolutely, I, I agree. Um, Lindsay wants to know how tall should my horse be for jumping five feet more or less <laughs> yeah and that's um, really high for me so I'm a real chicken over jumps <laughs> and and I think that's pretty high for anybody um, one of the really interesting things about jumping is the horse's height has a lot less to do with it than you would imagine and instead their athletic ability and training is what really determines their scope or ability to jump over higher fences. Um, when you go to a five foot fence would be a Grand Prix competition. When you go to the Grand Prix competitions, that being said, typically those horses are in the 16 to 17 hand range and the majority of them, it's very uncommon to find one less than 15 hands. But there are some very famous, even pony size horses um, that have jumped at that height successfully. Um, Douglas uh, is interested in adopting or buying an off track thoroughbred. Mm -hmm. um, he's got some training in his background, uh, but, um, and wants to ride dressage. Uh, but he, he's not sure quite about the experience of retraining a horse. So do you have any um, yes. advice for him? Absolutely. I, my first thought is don't buy an off the track thoroughbred straight off the track or straight off let down. Um, however, if you want that experience in a little bit of a safer situation, there are a lot of um, national and even state level competitions that encourage people to buy these off the track thoroughbreds and retrain them. And then often there are sales associated with the competition. So Dr. Skelly, do you remember the name? There's one in Kentucky in the fall and I wish I could remember the name of it, but it's a very well known one. It's at the Kentucky horse park and uh, these horses have been through an initial retraining program where they've been started in various different disciplines and then many of them are for sale at that competition and that would be a really great way to promote the industry and start in a safer way with an off-the-track thoroughbred. I absolutely love off-the-track thoroughbreds and I've done several of them myself but um, I think that they're best suited for a professional trainer or somebody working very closely with a professional trainer to start the whole retraining process. Yeah, and also I think just having some experience working with thoroughbreds because they, mm -hmm. if your if your past experience has been with uh, stock horses um, and you switch over to thoroughbreds, you're going to notice a difference. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Um, just going through the questions. Rachel had a, a good question. She had recently purchased a, um, a horse, and uh, after about the first two to three months, uh, she started uh, having a little bit of trouble uh, with some of the behavior of the horse. Um, and she's asking, is there any reason my mare would have become a very sour horse uh, in that short amount of time? Sure. I mean, I, I will say that, to be honest, it's completely believable. Horses are very trainable creatures, and sometimes a change of environment can um, change horses very quickly. Some horses are more stable and resilient to lots of different situations and others are more sensitive. 
And I would certainly uh, consider a starting with a veterinary exam to make sure that there isn't any physical problem that started with the horse since you purchased it, be it a ulcer or a sore body part, maybe due to equipment or equipment fitting. I would also look closely at your management and determining whether the horse needs more turnout or more feed or more socialization. And then finally, look at the way that you're riding the horse and conditioning the horse and your routine to determine if there's anything there that could make the horse um, more accepting of its current environment. But I will be honest and say, it doesn't surprise me and it absolutely could happen with a horse seller that was totally honest with you about the horse, that could happen still. Yeah, and I think that that goes back to uh, one of your initial points says, uh, just because you buy a horse doesn't mean you quit taking riding lessons. And one of the best things you can do is take riding lessons on your own horse, uh, Mm -hmm. because then you can really see how you progress and um, you're going to really enjoy that experience. Well, uh, Gwen, do you see anything that I have missed either on Facebook or um, through our Q&A? Looks like we are good to go. Um, I just want to uh, let y'all know that uh, this will be um, available on our Facebook page, uh, My Horse University. Um, But we will also, once we have this uh, closed caption, we'll also post it on our YouTube channel. So then you can uh, get back to it anytime you like. And we have a lot of other uh, great webinars uh, for people, especially if you're just looking into uh, horse ownership. They're all free. Um, You may also want to try out our uh, free uh, short course, Horse Ownership 101. Uh, That kind of takes you through basically the same process of horse selection, but also uh, takes you through the process of owning a horse once you get that horse. So um, that's a a great starter course uh, for people. And with that, I want to uh, thank uh, Susie for sharing uh, her expertise with us today. Um, We will definitely have her back. And uh, everybody, enjoy this summer. And hopefully you'll uh, be out there riding and um, uh, have a great, safe uh, rest of your year. And uh, we will talk to you later.